Welcome to the third group. My name is Cameron Williams. I work for the NRCS in Soda Springs, Idaho. Uh, Dan Lakey and Cody Cole are here with me today. Um, we have a little presentation, talk a little about what, what we've done, what I've done, um, what they've taught me. So a little bit about my operation. Uh, we're a 300 cow, cow-calf operation in Grace, Idaho. Uh, we've been there. I'm the fifth generation. My children are the sixth generation. We've been there since 1902 on the Bear River, north of Grace. I work for NRCS, and that, that's led me down the path I'm on. Uh, five or six years ago, I had attended several workshops like this and listened to all this stuff these guys are preaching, and I'm like, I don't believe some of that. And so before I could go tell a farmer he should plant this 13 species cover crop mix, I thought I'd better believe for myself. So that got me started down this road. Um, Primarily, we're a forage operation, alfalfa, alfalfa, alfalfa grass, small grain hay, triticale, oats, barley. Uh, tried some grazing corn this year. I've been trying cover crops since 2013. And uh, grazing corn, this was the first year I did, tried that, no-till. I've wanted to do that a long time. I uh, read about it, uh, looking for a cheaper way to feed my cows in the winter. Uh, and then... This year is the first year I have done true no-till cover crops. I'll show you some pictures of how I do it in just a minute. So you've all heard the five principles of soil health. I don't think we need to cover that. Uh, this is how I cover crop in the past. This is a 610 International double disc drill, metal press wheels, no down pressure, pulling a cult packer in front of it with my teeth down into triticale stubble. Uh, it isn't perfect but it's what I have. Uh, you do that, you get the seed out, you turn the irrigation water on, you can grow a really nice cover crop. Uh, this was the 2013, this is the crop I grew. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes with it. I didn't calibrate my drill right, I was too heavy brassicas, I was learning, but I could see the value in it. Um, it changed the soil. So 2015 was quite a bit better. I kind of dialed it in a little better to what I wanted to do. Um, we did some clippings on this year. It yielded between 5,700 and 13,000 pounds, depending on where we clipped in this stand. So that's planting the cover crop around the 1st of July, and then I'll fall graze that prior to winter. That's how I utilize my cover crops. Uh, so 2017 was a new experience. Uh, if anybody's, anybody's familiar with Grace, there's very little corn grown there. Um, what corn is not grown no-till? So if I preach these principles of soil health, I better learn live a few of them. So I hired a neighbor to come in and no-till it with his white no-till corn planter. Uh, that was the amount of ground disturbance it made. This was an alfalfa field that had been in seven or eight years, quite a bit of quack grass in it. We spring grazed it, burned it off with Roundup, planted right directly into it. So there, I was really pleased with the results. So the other thing I did new in 2017, um, I hired Cody to come in and plant with his 1890 John Deere drill after first cutting alfalfa. So we cut this alfalfa crop, it has a lot of quack grass in it. Uh, greened it back up and sprayed it, and then Cody came in and planted behind it, planted my cover crop in behind it. Uh, I also got him to plant into my triticale stubble. Uh, so this pictures that. I was pretty impressed with what that machine could do. The right piece of equipment made quite a bit of difference. Um, so this is, this is what that looked like in about 20 days. Um, you can see the green rows. That, that's the thing that most impressed me is how evenly my stand come up, how uniform across the rows it was. Uh, it really surprised me. Uh, my cover crop mix, you can see the species there. Every year I change species. I shift it around. Uh, I'm always looking for what will serve my purposes more. Every year there's something new. Every year something goes away I wasn't happy with the results of. Uh, so this is what that cover crop looked like the end of August. Quite a bit of diversity, uh, quite a bit of species, quite a bit of root diversity. Uh, this is the things that excite me. 
My wife thinks I'm nuts when I'll come home with a plant and wash in all the soil off the roots to look at the nodules. So those are faba beans on the left-hand side. Uh, Brandon talked about them. To give you an idea, those nodules are like the size of a walnut. Um, from what I've read, they'll produce 30% more nitrogen than a pea. And the cows still graze them. So this first year I've grown them. They're the thing I'm most excited about lately. So this is a different mix that I plant later. It's more of a cool season mix. This is the 10th of November before we started grazing it. Uh, picture the corn. So that you can see I was up on the pivot tower. The corn was reaching the truss rods. Uh, I was really pleased with the corn. Uh, and then you, there's a picture there. We grazed it. There's 240 cows and 65 yearlings in there. We fenced it into three acre strips and moved them every third day. Uh, Cows looked really good, they fleshed up. It served the purpose I wanted it to. I did forget the rule of diversity when I planted that, but I wanted strictly to know if I could grow the corn. Uh, so my future, I showed you my 610 drill. This is what the future holds for me. Uh, I talked my father into letting me get a new drill. Uh, so I bought a 1590 John Deere with a single disc opener. Uh, Cody's gonna talk a bit, quite a bit about that. This will allow me to do several of the things I want to with no-till um, that I haven't been able to previously. Uh, so that, that's the direction I'm headed in. Um, with that, turn the time to Dan. Thanks, Cameron. Um, if I need to speak up, just give me a thumbs up and we'll talk a little louder. But um, before I get into my presentation, I just want you guys to read what the background says right there. And it's kind of hard to read. It's in chalk writing from a seven-year-old, and it says, your journey has finally begun, welcome. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that if we have time at the end, but kind of keep that in the back of your, your mind. But I do wanna welcome you out here today, as uh, many of you are probably new or just beginning your soil health journey. As Cameron said, I'm Dan Lakey. Uh, we farm in Soda Springs, Idaho. And I'll just give you a, a Kind of a brief summary of our farm history. Uh, five generations, my grandpa homesteaded it in 1945. I'm raising the sixth generation right now. If you go back to South Carolina where we're from, uh, there were several generations there that farmed and after they came over from Scotland. And uh, our, our main place sits at 6,000 foot elevation uh, and we farm fields as high as 6,400 feet, which I thought I was just going to blow you guys away at that elevation until Brandon told us where he farmed. So not quite as impressive as what he's doing. Um, but uh, we've, we farm just under 8,000 acres. A uh, thousand of that is irrigated. The rest is all dry land. We get about 16 inch precip per year. And in the past, we've primarily grown the crops you see there. Just, just wheat and barley was our main rotation with the various different types. And about five or six years ago, we started growing yellow mustard and incorporating that into our our annual crop plan and that has been awesome. We have loved having that rotation, but we needed a legume. So we started growing yellow peas and those have worked out really well also. We started growing cover crops and we are dabbling in niche crops. We grew quinoa this past year. Uh, I wanna look at growing flax this year. We're doing some intercrop trials, growing two different species, planting them together, harvesting them together. I'm gonna try that out. It might be a complete failure, but we're gonna try it. Um, the reason why I want to try some of this is to add some more diversity, not only to our cropland, to our rotation, but also to our bottom line as well as spread out the risk a little bit. In 2010, we bought our first no-till drill, a John Deere 1895. And uh, then in 2011, we went and seeded winter wheat into spring wheat stubble in the fall uh, and no-tilled with it. Just and, and I wish I could tell you it was to do with the principles of soil health that you've heard here today. You know, you've heard the five principles. It had nothing to do with that. In fact, I don't even know if I'd ever heard the word soil health back then. Um, we did it because it's my 72 year old father, myself and my brother trying to get over these acres. So we did it just as a time saving measure. And then in 2015, we started doing cover crops. And uh, you guys have all met Cameron. He's a heck of a nice guy. He's our NRCS agent for Caribou County. And uh, if you would ever ask him about Lakey Farms' first cover crop experience, he's got really colorful adjectives to describe it. And they mostly all revolve around 
complete disaster, utter failure, uh, huge disappointment, and I think he told Keith Burns it was an abomination. So with that being said, you kind of know how he feels about my first experience with it. Um, and even though, you know, I, I tell him that's a little bit dramatic, that it wasn't that bad. Uh, and I'd like to say to him and all of you that Cameron, there are no failures in farming. There's only te test plots. So uh, I got that from Wheat Pete, if any of you guys have ever heard Wheat Pete's podcast that he does. Um, but this is a test plot we had on our farm this year. And uh, that's where a fertilizer tower plugged and we didn't have, we had nice strips of fertilizer, of no fertilizer being applied. And if you guys, I know that you, none of you guys make mistakes, but if you ever did, they're in the back 40 behind a hill where no one can see them. This is up on a hill facing Highway 30, the main artery through southeastern Idaho. Um, and our neighbors are, you can't see it because the words are covering up, but our neighbor's farm is right there. And so they get to see it. I got to see it every time I drove to, uh, drove to work and home each night. So that was a constant reminder. Um, oops. But uh, my first part of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about failure. Because all of us make mistakes in life. And it's kind of how we learn from these mistakes and that uh, can help us go forward. This is a picture of the very first cover crop that I ever planted. And I planted a no-till. We went into some, for us, fairly heavy winter wheat straw residue from the year before. It was an 80, 85 bushel dry land wheat crop, which for you guys, that's probably not that impressive. But for us, it was some fairly good residue. And there was a lot of rye growing up, which is probably a four letter word down here, just like it is in Idaho. Um, and so we had a lot of green uh, brome grass, volunteer winter wheat. And I just went in after I planted and sprayed it out with glyphosate. But um, by looking at that picture, can you guys tell me what I really screwed up on when I was seeding? What sticks out to you is failure right there. Yeah, it was too wet. I planted when it was wet and I planted in the morning when there was high dew. But that seed trench, I didn't close my seed trench. I didn't close the furrow. I only got half the job done. I, I was so worried about cutting through that residue. I'd heard everybody talk about, well, if you're gonna no-till, you need, you need sharp blades because you're gonna hairpin if you don't. So I put all new discs on my drill. And as you can see, I had no problem getting through that residue cut through it beautifully. I didn't finish the job. I didn't close it. And so planted it wet, um, didn't close my trench. And then we came in and did a burn down afterwards. And, and I love having that tool avail available to me. I love spraying after I plant, as long as you can get it sprayed before emergence. But for those of you who don't know, glyphosate has a negative impact on the germination of your seeds, especially legumes. And so as you can see by that wide open seed trench, I probably got some residue on my seeds that helped hinder my germination. So between all those things combined, plus it never rained again till late July after I planted this, we were not off to an awesome start. So as you, you know, Cameron, he was a little bit negative about it, a little negative Nancy, and, and uh, he probably had good reason to be. But even though um, it was a little subpar, I learned a lot. And this is a, a saying I really like, win or learn, never lose. And I think that's important because, you know, none of us are perfect. We're all going to screw up. We're all going to make mistakes. But it's how can we learn from these mistakes that we make? What can we do to come away from it better? And even though, you know, I think he was expecting my cover crop, or he was hoping, and when I planted that it was going to be this nine foot tall, looks like the Florida Everglades style cover crop, that just lush green that he could show you guys here at a presentation of what one of his producers grew. Well, it wasn't exactly that. It, that's what we got up there on the left-hand corner. Um, it wasn't that bad for as dry a summer as we had and, and the stellar start that we had, but that's what it ended up being. Um, but one thing it did is it got me, got me digging in the soil. Um, I started digging and looking at these tubers on these radishes and turnips and looking at the safflower tap roots. And it just got me out looking underground at the macro pores and the earthworms and the soil aggregates and the nodules on the legumes. All these things that I'd missed before that I hadn't cared about because how many of us as farmers get in our pickups and evaluate our crops at 55 miles an hour from the bench of our truck? You know, that, I was one of them. If it was green, it was healthy, right? This got me out and got me digging. I bought uh, a penetrometer to test the compaction layers on my soil. Uh, got infiltration rings from Cameron so that uh, we could check how, how fast we could infiltrate water. Bought a shovel for every single truck on the farm so that we could stop and dig whenever we, we wanted to. And 
And uh, we dug in our neighbor's fields and I think they probably thought they had a gopher issue because there were so many holes in their fields, but it was just us. Um, and if any of you have read the, the book by Masanobu Fukuoka, The One Straw Revolution, in there there's a quote that says, the best fertilizer for the soil are the footsteps of the farmer. And I think that's true. I think that we need to get out and walk and kind of evaluate the health of our crop from somewhere from besides the front seat of our pickups. Um, and this is from this past year, this is our 2017 full season cover crop. And, uh, and just kind of a picture to illustrate the different rooting depths and the different types. And we learned something this year too. I learned about herbicide residue. Um, we got bit by that. If you guys are wanting to do cover crops, take a look back through your notes of what you've sprayed the previous two years. We learned a lot about uh, ally extra residue. So it's, uh, it's a continual, continual process for me to learn this. I also learned that cover crops can make your wife happy. Uh, and she can clip some of, these are actually are all out of Cody Cole's cover crop from this year. And, and uh, you can, she can put them on your entryway and, and uh, do that. So uh, second part of my, my presentation, I've titled, What's Your Why? And the reason I talk about that, you might think that's kind of a silly question. I mean, what do you mean, what's my why? Well, we always talk about the processes, the tools, and equipment when we're dealing with agriculture, and these things are all important. There's no getting around them. All that stuff's critical to our success, but how often do we stop and ask ourselves, what are we doing, how are we doing it, and why are we doing it? And the what, that's straightforward. You guys all know that, or you should. Uh, we all know what we're doing. We're all farming, we're all ranching. That's what we do. Uh, the only exception to that is some of the hired high school help that I've had come to move irrigation pipe for me. Sometimes I wonder if they know what they're doing. Uh, but with, you know, all of us have got that covered. How are we doing it? This is where all of us reside usually. We, this is our day-to-day -day operations. The nuts and bolts, it's, you know, our fertilizer program. This is how we take care of our, our animals, how we farm, how we ranch. This is our nutrition programs. This is, you know, if we're doing tillage, this is how we prepare a seed bed. Um, just all those things that we deem critical to success that, that are a big driver of our success on our farms, but do we ever really stop to question why do we do it? Do we ask that question why? And what I mean by that is, I mean, why do you guys farm? Why do you ranch? Why do you do the things you do? Um, I've had a farmer tell me before, well, it's to make a, it's to make a paycheck, it's to get paid the next year. We raise a crop to get paid. I mean, you know, but honestly, all you guys know better than that. If it was just about the money, I mean, there's way too much risk, too much time, to all this stuff involved with farming and ranching, that if it was just about the money, I mean, where I'm from, there's a lot of phosphate mines, and you can go out there out of high school, make $80,000 a year, get full health care, and your weekend's off, and uh, if it was all about the money, I'd be out there doing that, but you guys know more than that. It's, it's, it's the lifestyle you live, it's how you raise your kids, it's growing crops and raising animals. So there's more to it than just that. And I think it's important that we ask ourselves what our motiv motivation is and why we do things. You know, if you're doing tillage, why do you do this this way? If you're um, growing certain crops in a ro rotation, ask that question, why? Is it because it's essential to your operation or is it just because grandpa did it that way? Or it's just because it's a habit? I had the oppor uh, opportunity to attend No-Till on the Plains in Kansas at the end of January. And I heard this young woman speak. This is Sarah Singla. She's a no-till farmer from France and a soil health innovator over there. And she said this quote that really stuck with me. She said, if farmers don't want to do something, they will find an excuse. But if they do want to accomplish it, they will find a means by which to be successful. And I think that's true. You know, think about us as farmers. We're extremely stubborn both ways. If we don't want to do something, we ain't doing it. You can't make us. If we want to get it done, there's nothing that can stand in our way. We'll make it work. Um, and so I think that's important when you face adversity and new things on your farm because too many times I've talked to people who have went no-till or used cover crops or all these things and they say it's, it won't work here. You know, they get hung up on no-till. And I was, at, uh, I was at a cereal school in southern Idaho about a year ago and afterwards there was a couple of farmers gathered around this guy who was a prominent farmer in the area ran really large acreage and they were listening to him and I heard the word cover crop come up so I kind of tuned in just to hear what they were saying. He says, yeah, I planted those stupid cover crops because I knew I wanted to prove to everyone that they wouldn't work and that they are a waste of time and money. And that just absolutely floored me because what's his why? I mean, he went into that 
cover crop with failure is his end goal in mind. What do you think his out, what did, what did he expect his outcome to be if his goal is failure? And so in my mind, he had the wrong reason for doing it. He had the wrong context. He was searching for failure from day one. And so I just would say to you guys, don't focus on no-till as the end all be all. Don't focus on cover crops as the, the means by which you're gonna be successful. Focus on them as being tools in which to accomplish your means. And I think, you know, because too many guys will switch to no-till but change nothing else about their operation. They won't change their management. They won't change the rotations. And all of a sudden they've got huge weed pressure. They've got compaction. They've got more, worse runoff. All these things that they thought was, was gonna get better have gotten worse. And it's because they made no-till fit their management instead of switching it around. Um, and honestly, we could, we could talk about equipment all day long. We could argue about which drill is the best. Is a double disc opener the best way to go? You know, some guys will say a hoe drill is the only way to go. Other guys will say a, a single disc. That's the only no-till tool you can use. Um, and even if you're doing tillage, you know, you've got to... My, my, my goal is to keep the soil covered. And so I don't care. We can argue about all that stuff. It's not important if you have the right goal in mind. And I want to keep my soil covered. And one of the reasons why was... Uh, the, this experiment shows it really well. This is Steve Groff, he's the cover crop coach. And I thought I was gonna blow you guys away by stumping you on what snurt was, but Dr. Don already, already let the cat out of the bag on that one. You guys have all heard that this morning, that snurt is uh, you know, basically soil covered snow, is wind blown dirt onto snow. Uh, and what he did is he took, and took a, um, a lab analysis of the, the field and of the snurt send it into a lab and had the, re the soil test done on it to see what the nutrient contents were. And what he found was pretty astonishing. Um, it's kind of hard to see up on the screen, but there's the snurt versus the field. Every single category minus sulfur was significantly higher in the snurt by quite a bit. The phosphorus, potassium, the organic matter was 3.6 in the snurt and 3.5 in the field. The CEC of the soil was even heavier in the snurt. Um, all those, all those elements were way higher on the snurt. So what does that say, guys? Our best soil is blowing off our fields. It's leaving our ground. And we can, you know, I don't care what combine you guys have. I don't care what tractor, what marketing plan. Our soil, our topsoil specifically, is our most valuable asset, bar none. If we lose it, we're out of business, right? Well, you know, you might say, well, just a little bit of, a blown dirt on top of snow, how significant is that? You know, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, I was at Burley, Idaho two weeks ago when the same line of thought come up. A producer said, um, I was listening to Gabe Brown's talk up there and, and a producer said to Gabe, well, I, I have flat land, I don't have water erosion. How significant is a little bit of, of dirt blowing off my field, really? And Gabe stopped his presentation, walked down into the front row of the audience and grabbed a sheet of paper off of a desk and he said, guys, the thickness of this paper is equivalent to one ton per acre of topsoil loss. So you think about that, with just the little thickness of that, that's one ton of an, uh, per acre. And our farms on average in the United States are eroding about five times that to seven times that. And so that, that's a huge deal. That really puts it in perspective that, um, you know, just even though it's a little thin sheet of paper thickness, it's, it's really significant over time. You know, and that may, you may not even see that in your guys' farming time, in your careers, but you know, your grandkids are gonna see that, your kids are gonna see that. Um, and with that being said, I just kinda wanna wrap up a little bit on my why, why I do the things I do on my operation. I'm not here to tell anybody how to farm, how to ranch, because I'm still figuring it out, but one thing I do know, that's my family up there, my wife with my three kids, and I've had a good life. I don't have anything to complain about, but I want to leave my soil in better condition than I received it. I want them to have a better life than I've had. I want them to be able to farm and not have to work one or two off-farm jobs to be able to support their farming habit. I want them to not have to be riddled with debt. I want them to be able to have a good resource. Um, and here's, I think I got enough time to talk a little bit about this, these steps with the chalk riding on it. What that is, those are steps leading up to Cody Cole's cabin um, at a reservoir in Soda Springs. We had, a, we had a field day where Keith Burns, he's the owner of Green Cover Seed. These guys have got your little booklet, that Green Cover Seed book. He's the owner of that company and he came down and did a, a field day at Cody's place this last uh, June or July. July. And uh, 
he's kind of a soil health icon and so we had a little barbecue the night before to kind of welcome him and, and you know gather around and hear stories and so we had our families out there and we sent them off to go play and stay busy so that we could pick his brain and, and, and listen to stories and you know get information from Keith Burns and and uh, so we were all kind of tied up in that and we forgot to kind of look around and he snapped this picture that was on the steps that says your journey has finally begun welcome and he he included that without telling any of us he took it had the foresight to to take time and see it and then he included it in his presentation the next day and he said that that you know all of us were kind of stepping over that and not really paying attention to it but he thought that that was important he said he felt welcome to soda springs and uh, you know and he, he equated that to we're all kind of starting out in our soil health journeys and no matter where we're at in our stages of farming but uh, he said he didn't know who did it it ended up being my daughter who had colored it so that was kind of cool because it's actually included on his uh, presentation that he does around the world um, so that's that that's my daughter that's em uh, that's Emery she's eight years old she's uh, she was born on the 4th of July and she definitely is my little firecracker she lives up to that reputation um, this little smiley fellow that's Trey he's four years old he's my big helper and my big buddy and he can usually be found riding in the passenger seat of anything that I'm working on in the farm and that's him on the left hand side he wanted to get his picture taken in some of the peas that we grew last year and uh, this is Grayson he's two years old and he is following right in his brother's footsteps he's usually just a, a step or two behind always wanting to be right where we're at and be a part of it and and that's a uh, he's sitting on a 1947 Farmall Super M that's similar to what my grandpa would have used when he started farming our place so um, with that, I want to turn you over to the time order to a guy who's going to tell you how not to make the mistakes that I've, that I've done and, and do a good job at it. Okay. My name's Cody Cole. I'm from Soda Springs, a uh, third generation farmer. We grow mostly spring wheat after spring wheat after spring wheat. Uh, you guys kind of know the wheat market's pretty dismal right now, so that's forced me to, to look at some different things. Uh, we grew mustard last year. That picture right there is me actually no-tilling some winter lentils in. Uh, I hope they turn out because that would be good for our rotation. Like Dan said, in 2018, we're going to try some intercropping. I'm gonna do mustard and lentils together and then mustard and faba bean together and we're gonna to try to harvest that as a cash crop, get somebody to clean and separate it and hopefully that works out. I'm pretty excited to see, see what we can do with that. Um, as my operations gotten bigger, I decided that I needed my own air drill. I talked Dan into going down and looking at one with me and needless to say, I came back with a single disc no-till drill and then a job for a company called Exapta Solutions. They're based out of Kansas. They sell no-till parts for corn planters, air drills, anything like that. Um, working for them, it's allowed me to go to Kansas a couple of times. I've been to no-till on the plains. I've been to Oklahoma. I've been in the field with corn planters and air drills in no-till situations. I've seen how they work. Uh, I've talked to guys all over the US, Canada, Australia. It's been, it's been a really good gig and it subsidizes my farming hobby. So this last spring, um, with the help of the NRCS, we decided that we were gonna do some cover crop trials. We took 10 one acre plots with warm and cool season mixes in it. I flew my drone out, that's kind of what it looked like, I think about mid-July. Uh, we had Keith Burns come. We spent a whole day learning soil health, learning the different different mixes and different things that grow together. And so that's kind of my intro into cover cropping. I'm still a rookie, I don't know a lot about it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> here's my wife. She, uh, she had to plant the, the trials for us. I was still busy trying to get the weed in. We got a little box drill from, I think it was the NRCS. Um, Cameron helped her fill up the blends. She planted it with no guidance, no GPS, I mean, no air conditioning, no nothing. And this is what it turned out to be. It exceeded my expectations. I think it exceeded Cameron's. 
Um, so then after we had the soil health day, I decided, well, how am I going to terminate this? So I'm a man of many hats. A cowboy hat is not one of them. So with the help of Cameron, we decided that we were going to kind of mob graze. And then my wife decided it'd be a good idea to get meat chickens to follow behind the cows. So what we did was we got electric fence. We fenced off little paddocks. I tried to move them, the cows, every about two to three days, um, let them completely graze it off. Then I went in and sprayed Roundup after, and then I'm going to plant spring wheat into it so I can see the quality, if the quality of my wheat changes by what we've done out here. And so that's a little bit of before and after. Um, you can see the cows in with the sunflowers. That's kind of what it looked like after they grazed it. it we kind of had a learning curve on how long to let them graze. And that top picture, you can see they kind of took it down to the dirt, which I wouldn't have let them do, but um, I guess lesson learned. And so working for Exapta, I've learned about all different types of equipment. Um, you've got a single disc, a double disc, and hoe drill. They all have one thing in common. When you guys go to the field and plant, what do you want? You want what you're planting to get uniform, high emergence. The better emergence you get, <clears throat> the more money you're gonna get in your pocket and the re better return on investment you're gonna have. And so, I don't know if they can see this up here, but this is a single disc John Deere drill. Um, it's a box, it's same as a box drill. John Deere has not changed this opener in I don't know how long. But anyways, the seed comes down, goes through your seed boot. Um, that tab keeps them from bouncing out that firms it in the soil and then your spoked wheel comes through and closes the slot. So that's the opener I use. Um, and I think a lot of guys down here are probably using double disc, which same thing, you gotta have good sharp blades, you gotta get the seed covered and uh, you'll get decent emergence. So the first step in my little presentation is you gotta cut the furrow, you gotta have good disc when you do that. If you see this, um, that's a wore out disc versus a new one. I mean, you can see completely the bevel's gone. That disc, if you're going to do more no-till, will not cut through anything. You'll see hair pinning, you'll fight it, you'll end up getting terrible stands, and you'll regret getting a single disc opener. So I tell guys, make sure your blades are sharp. Um, on that style, that blade new is 18 inches. Um, I tell guys if it gets down to 17, be replacing them. It's a cheap fix. You'll get better stands. You'll it'll just it'll pay it'll pay for itself having good decent blades on there. And so I guess the second step then I'll just kind of free ball this is uh, <clears throat> after you cut your furrow, you want to drop seeds in. Um, I have a slide that's uh, got a furrow cut. There's kind of just seeds scattered everywhere. If on that one, that bounce flap's going to keep your seeds from, from blowing back out of the furrow. And then after that, that yellow wheel that's on there, that's going to come through and firm the seeds down in there. The better job you do firming the seeds down in, the better emergence you're going to get because you're going to get better seed to soil contact. And then after that, you come through with a closing wheel. That one that I use is a spoked closing wheel or a spiked closing wheel. That'll come through. It'll crumble the sidewall and cover it up. Um, it's going to prevent your, your furrow from drying out. It's going to help the seeds um, have an easier path to come up through. And that's kind of what I know. Wish. Okay, there we go. We're good, we're back in business. Okay, so like I said, you got your four steps. Cut, seed, firm, close. That is the, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it's a single disc or double disc, it's the same concept. <clears throat> so in that picture, that was my winter wheat that I planted. Obviously you can see my seeds are just sitting there. That's not gonna be a very good return on my investment. Bad blades, cause that right there. Um, that's just a simple, easy fix. I should have known better, but that's what I did. And then here, too, um, 
you want to get seeds consistently down in the furrow. You can see on that right side, there's seeds just kind of scattered everywhere. They're not firmed in there. That's, they planted that really wet, probably fast. They didn't do a very good job. So then again, their return on investment's not going to be very good. <clears throat> and then you want to firm it. So this was actually the picture um, of Dan's peas with his little boy in it. This was him out planting that about two inches deep. You can see the uni uniformity on each of the seeds, the spacing, like everything is perfect about that picture. That wheel came along, it firmed it in, his emergence was fabulous, and so that's what you want to see with one of these openers. And I think it's kind of overlooked, Fir seed firming is kind of overlooked. If you go out and just say dust your crop in and mother nature don't come along and rain on it, what's going to happen? It's not going to grow. If you can at least get the seeds firm down into some sort of moisture, you're going to get something to grow. Something's going to germ, something's going to sprout, you're at least going to get something. And then the fourth thing you want to do is come along with a, a closing wheel and cover up your furrow. This was also my spring wheat that I'd done. Um, I'd done a trial, I kind of had some cast wheels and some spiked wheels. And you can see how it crumbled the sidewall. Um, Kind of a reason that I like spiked wheels is you can plant in little wetter conditions and it's still going to crumble and get some dirt on top of it. With a smooth closing wheel, they're heavy and the faster you go, they're going to tend to bounce. And when they bounce, they don't close the furrow. When they come back down and hit the sidewall, they're going to blow it out. It's going to cause compaction. They're, they're kind of a nightmare. And so this was my, my winter wheat, if you can see. Those two in the middle, that was with a spiked wheel. The one on the outside was a cast wheel. I mean, what can you tell me about that picture? I got a lot better stand where I used the spiked wheel. They had an easier path to get up. The, the emergence is a lot better. That right there sold me on them. And then this is what you don't want to have. This was planted way too wet. You can see the seeds just scattered in there. They're not firm down in. And then on the right side, you can see the, <clears throat> that big, the cast wheel came down and just blew out that whole sidewall. I mean, when that dries out, you think something's going to come up through there. It might find its way up through the crack, but it's not going to be very good. And then this was a field that we went down and checked out. Um, it's worked ground compared to no-till ground. Worked ground will cover up all the flaws of any no-till drill. Um, he probably went in and planted that jumped right over to the no-till, didn't change any settings, didn't adjust anything, and that's what he got. So then that kind of gives no-till a bad rap. Well, if he would have made some slight adjustments, he probably could have got the same stand as he's got in the workaround. And so basically, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, my air drill in the background, my wife and her little tractor, no guidance, no nothing. You've seen what she grew. Um, so just kind of work with what you've got, make simple adjustments, get out and walk behind your drill. You know, it'll tell you a lot if you get out and walk behind it. And so that's kind of what I have. If you guys got any questions for any of us, fire away. Do you put the hydraulic down pressure on your, on your drill yet? I have not put it on mine yet. Um, it's pretty expensive. Um, the more rows you got, obviously, yeah. the more you're going to have into it. What is it per row? It's 300 a row. But with that, I mean, if you've ever looked at one of these planting, it looks like a piano's moving. Oh, yeah. I mean, every opener. Yeah, with that, <laughs> <laughs> with that hydraulic system on there, every opener's the same, no matter what you set it at, and you're going to get better everything with it. If you want a half one with me, I will do it. We'll become partners. So, anything else for any of us? Okay, well, thank you guys for coming and listening to us.